E-readers have been in mainstream circulation for about 15 years now, but the debate still rages on about whether they're better or worse than physical books. Well, I'm here to solve it once and for all. You're very, very welcome. Because I love a little bit of research and summarizing, now seems like a perfect time to look at the technology behind regular books and the e-readers. This section actually started out as a little bit of a joke, but the more I researched it, the more I found it absolutely fascinating. So paper, what is it? Effectively, it's the fiber of grasses or woods. These are kind of stripped back, soaked, evenly distributed, pressed and dried in order to form what we know as paper. The modern form of it was invented in China around the second century by a gentleman named Kai Lun. Inks, on the other hand, well, they're a little bit harder to pin down because some of the first and most original forms of this would have been stuff like soot. But we can tie the modern version of inks to Mr. Gutenberg and the invention of the printing press around 1440, as he specifically needed something that would work with his invention. Since then, many of the fundamentals of bookmaking and printing have been the same, apart from, you know, technology, methodologies, processes, and ingredients. But uh, it's close enough for this. If you want a better, more in-depth explanation, I'm sure there are plenty of Discovery Channel programs for you to enjoy. Shockingly, surprisingly, breathtakingly, unbelievably, this is a more modern invention than paper and ink. Now we could talk for ages about memory and processes and touchscreens and all the elements that you know go into making an e-reader, but the biggest technological advance, the one we should discuss now, is e-ink. The display you're watching this on right now operates with something called frame rate. This means the roughly static image you're seeing is really lots and lots of pictures layered on top of each other that give the impression of movement. When it comes to reading, it's not particularly comfortable as your eye does over time recognize the constant movement happening and this is where e-ink comes in. Now, there's an absolutely huge amount of content we could create a bam off of videos over different types of e-ink technology, but for the sake and purposes of this video, let's just look at the fundamental way the technology works. So with an e-ink display, there are two screens, one at the top, one at the bottom. Both of them are electrically charged. Between these two screens are black and white ink, both charged too. To form words on the screen, the shape of them are then charged to attract the black ink, while the spaces are charged to attract white ink. This then literally leaves the ink sitting on the top of the screen. This delivers a display that can be used in bright sunlight, really replicates paper, and uses basically no battery power whatsoever because the words stay charged to the top layer of the screen. Now we've looked at the technology underpinning both formats, let's zoom in a little bit and have a quick run through about why people prefer a physical book or an e-reader over the other. And because it is way more fun to be competitive, let's focus particularly on what they dislike about each tech. Here are some of the things that people dislike about books. Weird smell, how heavy they are, how much space they take up, hard to read in low light, not waterproof, at all. And now some of the things that people dislike about e-readers. No smell. Feel cheap and weird while reading. You can't build a proper physical collection your friends can marvel at, loan them out or buy them secondhand. And not as easy to read or remember specific pages. Look, there are valid reasons to like and dislike both sides of the e-reader versus physical book debate, but I'm here to make a statement, nay, a proclamation. Both of them are best. If there's one point I'd like to make, it's that all those points we listed above, all the negatives, well, they're all true. And this means one thing. Why the hell shouldn't you use both an e-reader and actual books, man? really should be a psychologist. What I found is balancing these two different formats is all about building a narrative and creating a structure that works for you personally. To show how that works, I'll kind of use myself as an example. I use e-readers specifically when I'm reading kind of more light-hearted, upbeat, kind of page-turning novels. 
In other words, things where the story, the plot, the driving force is more important than the way it is being delivered. Another reason for this is I absolutely love the way that you can, you know, switch your ebook from, you know, an e-reader device like this onto your phone. That means you can like quickly go through pages if you're waiting for the bus or just have a few free minutes in between meetings. But if I'm looking at a piece of more serious literature, there's something about feeling it in my hands, the tactile nature of seeing the words on the page in front of me that really just make it work. Plus, I've just got a huge love of building collections. Anyone can go back and check the Blu-ray or the CD videos we've done and creating a, making a library is something that I just adore, so I could never drop that fully. It's important to note that I do play fast and loose with this though. Sometimes I'll read a piece of highbrow literature on my e-reader, or others I'll get a piece of hack and flash fantasy in book form and enjoy myself. It's more in my mind about being able to incorporate both technologies in your life and find a way it works for you because it's fantastic. As we're a technology channel, in this section we're gonna focus on the gear, but I'd hate to be in a situation where I do a piece about books and don't get to recommend a whole load of fantastic novels. So here they are. Following that, I would like to fulfill my promise of doing what a technology channel does and talk about technology, specifically two e-readers, one of them a Kindle, another one not a Kindle. What's there to say about the Kindle Paperwhite that's not been said already? It's just a fantastic e-reader, chock full of features that is just getting better continually. The latest model in itself is an absolute marvel. But whatever Kindle Paperwhite you have or Kindle in general, you're gonna find a machine that is simply a delight to read on. But it goes even beyond that. The whole ecosystem of the Kindle is fantastic. The app, the way it links up with Audible. Amazon has really made a huge united system here that works ideally for a reader, but there is one problem with it all, and that is Amazon itself. I've already said, the Kindle is an amazing bit of technology that does almost everything you could want from it, but the damage Amazon as a company done to not only the book market in general, but also the labor market as a whole is untold. It really is not a particularly ethical company and one that is becoming increasingly hard to support post-pandemic. Yet, all is not lost. I'm not gonna judge you if you want to go for a Kindle, that's fine, but I'd also like you to know that there is a good alternative out there, and that is what we're gonna talk about right now. I could have chosen a smaller brand or something more independent, but what I think Kobo does is provide a viable alternative to the whole ecosystem and setup of Amazon's Kindle. The model specifically I've chosen to kind of talk about a little bit today is the Kobo Libra H2O, this little device you can see in front of us. The reason I selected this is generally, I think in terms of features and price range, it is you know in this sweet spot where it's not too expensive, but not too cheap and is absolutely chocked with features and is a joy to use. You can have a little you know, screen look at some of them now. In terms of use, I'd say it's totally comparable to the Kindle. Maybe there are some things that the Kindle does slightly better, like maybe I just enjoy the build quality slightly more, but we're talking about slivers of a percentile here. You're not gonna notice much difference. But to return to the point I made earlier about why the Kobo range is a good alternative to Kindle, it's basically because you can do the similar thing with the app where you can switch between that bit of software and the e-reader itself and read seamlessly across devices. If you're looking for the moral side though, one of the most important parts is the Kobo store allows independent booksellers to distribute and get money for selling e-books themselves. Yes, it can be sometimes a little bit more expensive than Amazon, but you know you're actually supporting the industry as a whole. And for any avid bookworms amongst us, that friends is a good thing. There you go. 
I've solved it for you. It's all done. You should buy physical books and buy e-books and e-readers and just read and enjoy whatever it is you want to read. Love you lots. Au revoir.